Good afternoon. I'm Rick Wade, Senior Vice President for Strategic Alliances and Outreach here at the United States Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us for this forum on the impact of our coalition to back black businesses, a first of its kind collaboration that includes the Chamber Foundation for leading black business organizations, American Express and other corporations. Today, we'll share valuable information and resources to support the long-term success and resilience of our country's Black-owned businesses. We'll discuss how we can also inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs. And as we celebrate Black History Month, we sh should pause to reflect on the strong tradition of innovation and entrepreneurship in the Black community fostered by a history of economic exclusion that drove so many to create their own enterprises. During the early 19th and 20th centuries, African-American innovators and entrepreneurs were prolific. They included the likes of Thomas Jennings, the first black patent recipient for a dry cleaning process. Louis Latimer, who invented a technique for making carbon filaments for the electric incandescent lamp. And Madam C.J. Walker, a self-made millionaire who revolutionized the hair care industry. And let's not forget about Black Wall Street, that exceptional self-sufficient business district in Tulsa, Oklahoma, built by Black entrepreneurs. But despite this rich entrepreneurial history, the economic potential of African-American ingenuity has still yet to be fully embraced and realized. According to Brookings, Black businesses comprise only 2.2% of the nation's 5.7 million employer businesses. Black-owned businesses are less than half is likely to get financing as white-owned firms. The National Bureau of Economic Research reported that 41% of Black businesses closed from February to April 2020 as a result of the pandemic. So you see, we clearly have much work to do to strengthen and in some cases rebuild our country's Black-owned business ecosystem. It's not just the right thing to do, a moral imperative, it's critical to America's economic competitiveness. I wanna thank you again for being with us this afternoon and I hope you will enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Rick. And thank you to each of you who are joining us for this very important forum. I'm Latricia Boone, Vice President of the U.S. Chamber's Equality of Opportunity Initiative, and I'm excited to facilitate our next conversation, which features amazing panel of leaders who are helping to shape and inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs. Rick just shared some stark statistics that confirm we do have a lot more work to do. But today's speakers remind us that the opportunity is promising. As we think about entrepreneurship today, there continues to be a rise in people starting businesses, especially in new black owned businesses. In fact, data from the Kauffman Foundation shows that more black Americans started businesses during COVID riddle 2020 than in any of the previous 25 years. I wouldn't say that these statistics are surprising, but they are insightful. So today's conversation is a timely one. As we celebrate Black history and the legacy of our Black business pioneers during the month of February, it's important to emphasize that the work we're doing through our Equality of Opportunity Initiative here at the U.S. Chamber is focused on supporting and strengthening Black and minority-owned businesses throughout the year and is a long-term commitment for our work. Our guests for this panel conversation are partners in this goal. They actively inspire and help to cultivate the next generation of diverse entrepreneurs through their own work. Whether expanding access to entrepreneurship, educating current and future entrepreneurs, or pursuing entrepreneurship themselves, they are living history, blazing trails for the future, and showing others what's possible. So let's jump right into this dialogue. I'm going to invite each of our speakers to introduce themselves more formally and share a bit more about their own experiences. But first, I just wanna give a quick preview of who we have with us today. Joshua Funches, founder and president of the National Youth Bike Council. 
Dr. Tashan Macon, Chief Marketing Officer at Sky's the Limit, and Dr. Anthony Wilbon, Dean of Howard University School of Business. Thank you all. So excited to have you here with us today. And I'm actually going to start with our new entrepreneur in this group. Uh, Joshua, you started your business in the last five years, uh, which, by the way, is a social enterprise, one that we're seeing more and more of folks starting social enterprises in recent years. Tell us about the driving force or inspiration behind starting the National Youth Bike Council. And please, as you answer this question, introduce yourself and tell us more about your company. Yes, absolutely. And um, first of all, thank you for having me be a part of this panel. My name is Joshua Funches, the founder and current president of the National Youth Bike Council and um, a driving force, yeah, an absolute driving force behind the creation of the council was actually, uh, I believe, what happens when you get young people together that want to see positive change in their communities, uh, but simply using bicycles as a healthy and affordable means to do so. Um, particularly about the council, I used to be a part of like a local youth bike group where there was like this annual event every single year for young folks. And one of the purposes of that particular event was that young people had the opportunity to step up and lead and share ideas. So we sort of thought, you know, my little local council and there's a bunch of other little local councils, what if we just get them together, combine them for like the maximum effort of that purpose while simultaneously creating new possibilities like uh, a new leading council while also inspiring other young folks to create their own councils and see more of them leading and pushing for change, positive change using bicycles in their communities. And you know, that of course comes without having to mention how we believe that um, in an inclusive world, bicycles connect young folks, foster a healthy lifestyle and create broader communities and for spaces for them to thrive and learn from each other. Wow, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing because you really are using your platform to think about entrepreneurship, but also how you're inspiring others to get engaged and be part of the great work that you're doing. I wanna move to uh, Dean Wilbon and Dr. Macon to talk a little bit about more and more folks who are starting businesses and what that means as we talk about inspiring entrepreneurship. I'm sure you all have seen the reports and the stories that tell us that a number of people are starting businesses and it continues to increase. Um, and more and more people of all ages are embracing entrepreneurship, quite frankly. Dean Wilbon, I think of a conversation we had last year where you talked about probably uh, comparing my generation of students coming out of Howard University versus those who are graduating today and the fact that you know, previously many more were thinking about graduating, going to work for big major corporations, going to work for businesses. And now we're seeing a, a generation of folks who are graduating, even if they're going to work in that corporate environment, they're still thinking about entrepreneurship as ultimately the space that they're going to move into. Can you share a little bit, and I'll start with Dean Wilbon and then move to Dr. Macon, a little bit about, you know, from your experiences, what do you think is driving this? And then what is the opportunity for those of us that are working to support that business ecosystem? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I think this, there's, a, there's a historical perspective. There are a couple of different items here to, to unpack, I think. Uh, historically, again, we've been fighting for a very long time to get uh, uh, our foot into the door of corporate entities. Uh, the Howard University School of Business has been preparing students to enter that space for, for decades now. Uh, we fought for the right to get into those spaces. and and try to make a splash. But I think what's happened in recent years is people have gotten frustrated with the opportunities for advancement. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the whole glass ceiling thing still exists. And so people are bumping their heads against the ceiling. They're getting frustrated with advancement in almost every sector of corporate America. Um, and they're bouncing out to, to think about opportunities they can create for themselves. And, and so, um, you know, we're trying to, in, in the School of Business here, trying to provide some support for those students who might be having those interest in entrepreneurship by creating programs that will allow, allow that to happen. But in addition to that, I think, um, you know, it, it's become convenient uh, uh, somewhat for people to explore starting their own businesses. I think technology has allowed people to kind of uh, expand uh, their search for opportunities to, to enter and engage in small businesses. Uh, certainly the, the recent pandemic has provided folks with the, the spark to consider uh, something that's going to allow them more flexibility and autonomy uh, to, to create those businesses. And, and because of the ecosystem that's been been created through uh, things like the gig economy and, and, and such, um, although we've had a history of being risk averse uh, to, to jump out there and start our own businesses, the risk have come down somewhat and it makes it more uh, interesting and, and easier for people to digest uh, the fact that starting a business is a possibility. 
And so we see all of that happening and taking place. Um, the, the, the people are jumping out of corporate entities and it's easier to start your own business. And so we have to we have to build a, an ecosystem to support that. And that's exactly what we're trying to do at Howard University in collaboration with some of the other companies who, who also recognize the need for us to expand the number of, uh, of African-American businesses across all spe- sectors of business. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So, so Dr. Macon, hearing that, I think Dean Wilbon gave us a nice synopsis of what some of the things that they're seeing on the academic side. I know you, through your work with Sky's the Limit, which I know you'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, work with entrepreneurs all the time and every day. And, and what are you all seeing and, and what do you think is driving that? And I'll add a little bit of a, another follow-up question onto your question. That's, you know, what does this mean and what is the opportunity as we think about our communities and communities of color? Thank you for that question, uh, and hello to everyone. I think uh, what we're seeing at Sky's the Limit is that um, there is this season of the great resignation has opened up a period of the great reimagination. So uh, persons of color are reimagining their lives, and entrepreneurship is at the essence uh, and the very ethos of how they are reimagining their lives, their personal life, as well as their professional lives. Uh, and so for at Sky's the Limit, we are a platform, we're a destination for the dreamer, a destination for the innovator, a destination for the artisan. And we pair them with mentors in the corporate space so that they're able to scaffold, scale, and sustain their business over time. Um, the other thing that we have seen at Sky's the Limit is, um, as, as, as Gene Wilburn has said, uh, there was a period of time in corporate America, it was a both and proposition. They invited the entrepreneurial spirit and it was then classified as the intrapreneur. And by inviting that energy and inviting that space, what you began to then see was this expansion of how the professional was showing up in the workspace. And so we're seeing this evolution of how people are showing up as their whole selves and therefore being able to give of themselves through the sky's the limit platform to actually engage, inspire, encourage, exhort of the next generation of entrepreneurs by using their own expertise, their own centers of excellence to help them scaffold, scale and sustain their business. And I hope that's pretty much answered your question. If not, I'll unpack it further. Yeah, absolutely. I actually want to stay with you for a second to build on that a little bit as we see this increased momentum around entrepreneurship uh, due to the things that you talked about, some of what Dean Wilbon talked about, and I'm sure there are other things driving it. Can you share more about the, in terms of the work that's happening at Sky's the Limit, what are the ways, what are the resources that you're offering, the tools, the supports to new entrepreneurs, emerging entrepreneurs, to really help them to, as you say, scale, scaffold, and be successful? Absolutely. So we are a portal for any experience of the entrepreneur, whether you are emerging, expanding, or established. That's one of the first things uh, that I'd like to share, primarily because wherever you are in the entrepreneurial arc, sky's the limit is is that place for you because we, we have membership experience classes. We have certain classes around how do you get your your pitch um, your pitch perfect? How do you get your, your slogan about your organization tight and succinct that you can say it in eight seconds, uh, in eight words, in eight seconds or less? We have a membership experience that is curriculum based. Therefore, uh, a, a, a entrepreneur is not required to have an MBA. We use the experience of our professional ethos to then inform how entrepreneurs can leverage that kind of human capital, uh, institutional knowledge to implement readily so they can leave our mentorship conversations and they have actionable things that they can do that will enhance their business in real time. Uh, So we also have grants, which is critical. Uh, To be very frank on this call, most uh, people of color do not it is not an absence of intelligence. It is not an absence of imagination. It is an absence of investment. And so what Sky's the Limit is aware of, is that true? And so we see the future of money and the future of an entrepreneur's money in very different ways. So we offer grants for our, our entrepreneurs. We offer pitch contests that are connected to grants 
for our entrepreneurs. And there are several other elements that are in the works so that we can elevate this conversation around access, which is really what entrepreneurs of color are desiring. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that description. I'm gonna come back in a minute to the access and investment piece, because I do think that's critical and important as we talk about inspiring the next generation and what the needs will be as a part of the ecosystem. But I wanna turn back to Joshua for a minute. And, and Joshua, again, you're fairly new to some extent uh, when we talk about that that group of folks who've been starting businesses in the last few years to this. Um, and, and you might consider yourself a younger entrepreneur from a demographic standpoint. You have a unique perspective that you bring to this conversation in terms of your journey. Can you talk a little bit about like what are two to three big lessons you've learned along the way in this work? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would say I'm absolutely fully new to this uh, particular environment. Um, I would say that I, I have two big things that I learned. One was a little personal. One was just a realization. Um, the first one was that uh, brick and mortar um, really doesn't really need to be in every single aspect of the particular business that I'm creating. And, and for a lot of other you know young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs in general, that's the case um, because I'm part of a group where young folks who just like to ride bikes, we like to build them, share the joy of them, or even the sport. Um, but the biggest part of our business is evolved around the extended community who can't always be with us uh, when we're doing some of those things. So it's worth noting, but also not limited to the fact that, um, you know, sometimes in order for us to make a particular impact, uh, it does start online. And on a personal note, I had learned um, that it was actually a big learning lesson for me to realize that, um, you know, distributing work is absolutely fine. Um, it speaks directly to the purpose of the council in a way where, you know, like the quality of learning actually really comes through mistakes. And so we like make mistakes and learn together. Um, I, actually, I can even think of a third one. Um, I, I personally experienced this myself where I feel like the best, you know, businesses are the unintentional ones, uh, especially around social enterprises. Um, I feel like I fell into this role, you know, loving the idea of a national youth bike council. And there are like so many health, mental, physical benefits to things like that. And I would love to continue to see folks with my color continue to fall into businesses that and spaces that support them to run those type of businesses. Yeah, thank you. So uh, just a quick follow up question there, because you touched on to a certain extent risk, right? And being able to make mistakes, which is a huge part of business and coming back from that. Could you share maybe one tip, because I'm sure you have a, a lot of them, right? You could probably write, write a, a bit of a book right now, but maybe one tip that you might offer to some of our inspiring entrepreneurs, emerging entrepreneurs who might be uh, listening to this conversation today. Sure. Um, say, saying a tip almost makes me feel like I'm an expert of something, uh, but I feel like that's exactly what I'm not. And so um, I feel like if in every single aspect of my business, I've asked for help at one point. And I, I, I think that that's important, but I don't think that it means that I didn't know what I wanted. I think that by asking for help, it actually helped me better shape uh, what, I, what my asks were for and also what kind of questions were out there. Um, and an advice that someone gave to me recently was that in some cases, it's better for the person asking for help to find you. So in most cases, I was that person seeking out others to ask for help. So, um, you know, if you're ever going to make an ask, I would have to definitely say to some of these, you know, newer entrepreneurs, um, know what you want and um, go seek out those people. Um, I know particularly for myself, I'm always looking for help. So, you know what I'm saying? You find me on LinkedIn, but um, I would definitely say know to what you want because it makes the person helping you, uh, it makes it easier for them to help you. Yeah, thank you. And that really speaks to the ecosystem, right? Because if you're going to ask for help, there has to be a system out there to really support you to get the answers that you need. So I'm going to turn to Dean Wilbon again, and you all are doing some really amazing things at Howard University that are contributing not just to the university and the community around you, but really the broader ecosystem of supporting businesses. And recently announced a new and innovative partnership with PNC Bank. I think I've heard that it's you know one of the first of its kind in terms of creating an ecosystem that includes a network of historically black colleges and universities supporting expanded opportunities for entrepreneurship through enhanced education, leadership and capacity building resources. Can you tell us more about this initiative and the impact you all are hoping to have? Sure, yeah. The, uh, the What's important here is uh, to, to uh, Dr. Macon's point, we, we wanna build an infrastructure, an ecosystem 
that's going to uh, support uh, and sustain small businesses. Of course, we know that small businesses have a very high failure rate. Um, and, and in African-American uh, businesses, that's it's even higher. And a lot of it is attributed to a uh, lack of access to finances and information about how to how to build a, a sustainable model for entrepreneurship. So um, we presented an idea to PNC, which they were embracing uh, greatly about uh, using our HBCUs as a network to reach entrepreneurs, not only within the school systems that, that we have, but also the communities that surround them. And so uh, the model is that the, we're going to have kind of a hub and spoke model where uh, hosted here at Howard University will be a uh, Howard University PNC National Center for Entrepreneurship um, with four regional locations at Morgan State in Baltimore, um, Clark Atlanta, and Texas Southern. Um, there will be regional centers of entrepreneurship, and then they would uh, take within those regions, make connections with the other HBCUs in those regions uh, to share information about entrepreneurship, uh, provide uh, access to resources, uh, access to, to capital, uh, uh, not only focused on these students within those institutions and the surrounding areas, uh, but also help to build up small businesses across the, the country and using the, the HBCUs as the, as the kind of the, the vehicle to do that. Uh, we think this is a novel, a novel idea. We think it's going to be very successful. We've already started working through uh, how we're going to plan to build that. Now, we're, we're going to be seeking a, a director of that center very soon. But I think what, again, what, what is important here is, uh, as, as you've noted a couple of times, is building an ecosystem so that people can be comfortable sharing and asking questions and understanding what it takes to, to start a business, but also uh, informing them of what it takes to sustain them. Uh, and, 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 you know, we've, we've had a, a small business development center here in, in the Howard University School of Business for 40 years now, this is the DC Small Business Development Center. And a lot of the focus on that, for example, is with, with um, giving access to, to loans uh, and, and connecting with the banks and so forth. But the, the flip side of that is I think there's an opportunity for us to get new small businesses to think about how to get access to equity, uh, equity investments and angel investments. And as uh, Dr. May, Mason, uh, Macon mentioned, uh, pitch how to pitch yourself to these people to get access to those funds. And we're talking about entrepreneurs of all of all sorts, social entrepreneurship, uh, as one of your guests is, is focused on technology, entrepreneurship, franchising, whatever uh, the opportunity is, we're trying to build that into the center such that we can create this network uh, that's going to be uh, having a, a major impact on the entrepreneurship space. Thank you. So, so I know we only have um, a little bit of time left in our panel, and I feel like we could go on for much longer because there's a lot to unpack here. But there was a question that came up from our audience. I'm going to pivot from what I was originally going to ask as our closing question to this question, because I think it's an important one. And that's around how we would describe the what what an ecosystem is. So when we're talking about, we keep using that word, and I think it's going to be thrown around a lot today in, in the conversations we're having beyond this. But when we say ecosystem to support Black businesses, Black and minority-owned businesses, what do we actually mean? And I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer, but would love to hear from you all who are experts in this. And that includes you, Joshua, as someone who is asking the questions and getting the support. I'm going to give a chance as we close out for each of you to share. And I will start with, um, this time I'll start with Dean Wilbon and then move around the panel to say, well, so when we talk about an ecosystem, what is that? Sure. Yeah. So in my opinion, the ecosystem is having an integrated set of relational uh, systems that will allow people to share information, uh, uh, access information, grow uh, together and explore opportunities together. And that that uh, ecosystem includes everything from corporate entities and partners, uh, educational institutions, nonprofit entities, uh, the banking system, other entrepreneurs. Uh, I think everybody has an opportunity to contribute to what we're trying to build here. And again, so the system itself is encompassing of all all constituents and stakeholders who have an access in the growth of, 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 uh, of small businesses um, and figuring out a way to integrate them all so we can all have be working towards the same mission. Dr. Macon, what would you add to that? I think uh, Dean Wilburn hit it on the head. The only thing I would add is that it's, it's almost like seeing a wheel. If you can see the hubcap on your wheel, there are all these bespoke necessary entities at, that integrate into the hub of it. So it's relationships, it's resources, it's reach, um, and it's people who help you know how to 
get to the necessary results for your desired outcome. And so it's a fully, it's the ecosystem itself is, is more circular than, than, than square, so to speak. It's not about sides. It's about the cycle by which your business uh, evolves, where you come into, where you enter your business, and then how you cycle uh, uh, through its growth. And all of the relationships and the constituents and the stakeholders that help you get to scale in a manner and success and sustainability in a manner that's meaningful for you. Thank you. And then, so Joshua, I'm going to personalize it for you and say, maybe you can share what has been an important part of the ecosystem that you've been able to develop for your business. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, I, I have to agree with both of them. I actually think they hit, hit it on the head, especially uh, Dr. Roban, um, particularly where he was talking about um, all stakeholders being involved in that, uh, that initiative. Um, I want to actually put some emphasis there. Um, particularly around the fact that when we talk about all stakeholders, it would definitely be interesting to see some of the folks definitely at the bottom. So I would sort of find myself as those, those of them that are really just getting introduced, even being able to create a space for those people to continue to connect in this particular ecosystem. Um, I feel like that would continue to create um, a, a flow of people in and a flow of people connecting and seeing the ecosystem uh, definitely thrive. Um, I would say some things that were particularly important to my growth um, was honestly access to funding that that was really really useful. Sky's the limit actually, you know, gave me some of my first funding for the National Bike Council. It was definitely a leg up. I would say access to jobs, even if we're trying to be entrepreneurs in this particular ecosystem. Some of those things do, uh, you know, help. So like even employers understanding how it can be supportive to those type of folks, and then um, access to you know as you know professional and peer networks. Well, thank you all. I truly appreciate you taking your time today to be a part of this conversation. On behalf of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, thank you. We look forward to continuing this conversation and partnering with you to advance some of the ideas and solutions that were shared today. Um, now I'd like to just move us to the next part of our program. It meant everything. Um, the grant, I cannot, it was life save. It was, um, it was life save. As you know, as, as an entrepreneur, every dollar is, it feels like it's life saving. <laughs> so right. it really was, man. You know, we were able to use on equipment. Um, we're hoping to apply for more grants because we need facilities and other things. And as a business, not just a black business, but all businesses, you're constantly worried about investment and scale and, and resources. Um, and so for us, man, I cannot tell you, it's the first grant that we ever uh, received. And we were, I mean, we were, I mean, I can't even explain to you how it, it was like, no way, because we've applied, we've applied for so many things and just haven't got it. And so when we got this, it meant so much. And we were just so, so excited, almost in tears, man, because it means so much. It's life-saving and especially in these times. So, um, I am eternally grateful and, uh, I just cannot tell you how, how awesome it felt. It was a breath of fresh air. Hello. Oh, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. I'm the CEO of Fondo Strategic Consulting, but more importantly for here, the program manager for the Coalition of Back Black Businesses. And I want to thank you all and, um, for coming today and welcome you to our second panel. We're going to have an exciting discussion on an important topic, how to grow your business. Um, you know, entrepreneurship is important, but we also want to help you grow them. After you them. And so whether you're a coalition of bad like business grantee or not. And so as some of you may know, the Coalition of Back Black Businesses is a multi-year initiative support um, black entrepreneurs um, and the communities. Um, they serve as they recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. The coalition was established in September 2020 by American Express, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation, the National Black Chamber of Commerce, the National Business League, U.S. Black Chambers, and Walker's Legacy. In addition to American Express, our grant funders for 2021 and 2022 uh, were ADP, Altice USA, AIG Foundation, Dow, and S&P Global Foundation, along with programmatic support from Stanley Black & Decker, Shopify, 
and Firefly. Over the past two years, the coalition has distributed $5,000 grants to over 1,000 businesses all throughout the United States um, and provided them also with assistance for coaching and mentoring. And so I'm pleased to leave this discussion with our distinguished panel uh, that will be talking about their support for the coalition, but also, and I think more importantly, uh, additional help that uh, they can provide that might be out there for the business owners watching today. Uh, our first panelist is Eris Scales, <laughs> Managing Director and CEO of Walker's Legacy. Eris has been a champion for women entrepreneurs and underserved communities for nearly two decades. Before joining Walker's Legacy, Eris was appointed by DC Mayor Mario Bowser to serve as the district's official chief service officer. And prior to that role, Eris was the vice president of economic growth and jobs for the World Business Chicago. Thank you, Eris, for joining us today. Thank you. Our second panelist is Melody Jackson, director of strategic impact partnership at Eureka.biz, our partner in mentoring and coaching. Uh, Melody uh, has over 20 years of experience in financial service industry and in corporate communications, private banking, and wealth management. Melody partners with Fortune 500 companies to implement initiatives serving underserved communities. And we're happy to have Melody here. And our third panelist is Eurasi Thompson, Marketing Operations Manager for Black Entrepreneurship Team at Shopify. She is in charge of creating and executing on marketing strategies to support and highlight and elevate Black entrepreneurs. She's also a co-chair of the Global Women's Employee Resource Group at Shopify, which is responsible for championing women's uh, employees at the company. So again, a very distinguished panel um, and real supporters of the coalition, and we're very excited for you to be here today. I want to remind everybody, just as the previous panel, uh, we'll be taking questions, so please enter those into the chat, and they'll be giving uh, them to me during the presentation here. Um, and so again, thank you for coming, and I know Melody will be joining us again in a minute. Uh, but I, I really do want to start with kind of a basic question, you know, a, a level setting question for everyone. And so I'll start with you, Eris. You okay. know, why did Walker's Legacy, you know, why, do you, why did you support the coalition to back like businesses? Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me. And as you know, I inherited the coalition coming into this role. But I would say I could only imagine that we initially signed on uh, because of the importance of working with the private sector, bringing the not-for-profit sector, uh, small businesses, and this kind of ecosystem, as we've been talking about, uh, together to collectively um, make sure that we're driving uh, funding, that we are being a, a voice, and that we're aware of the issues that are impacting Black businesses. So for Walker's legacy to be at the table, one, it's an honor and a great responsibility uh, but most importantly, it is because we know that we cannot do the work that we do independent of ourselves. about that a little, a little um, you know, um, I was just wondering, you know, you had definitely supported, you definitely support, you know, women entrepreneurs throughout the country. Is there, um, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, some of the unique challenges there? Oh, absolutely. So just to, to kind of set the tone for everyone, Walker's Legacy is uh, a 12 year plus nationally focused organization uh, to inspire, engage and equip women uh, along their entrepreneurial journey. We specifically, not specifically and exclusively, but really are looking at the lens through black women, uh, which is about 90% of the, the demographic that we engage with. And there's, you know, traditional issues and barriers that they face around access to capital and uh, having access to expanded networks to support uh, their business. 
But we also know that these women have shared with us the importance of mental health and uh, wellness and self-care into their practices to feel like they have what it takes to continue on uh, with running their business. So a lot of what we're doing now is really focusing on building that tribe and building uh, those practices in terms of applying uh, you know, centering and grounding and meditation and, and being okay to take a break uh, into your practice uh, with your work. But we're also making sure that we are supporting women around uh, issues like increasing their confidence uh, and understanding that they are naturally fitted and that they are in the right place at the right time to run their businesses and lead their businesses and give back to the economy. And then the last is around connections. Uh, you know, so many of us come into entrepreneurship, not with a blueprint, um, not with a roadmap that was given to us before, uh, but we show up with a passion uh, and a commitment to improving the outcomes in our livelihood. And sometimes with that, we're looking around, particularly with social media these days, and that can start to chip away at your confidence. And it also could be a hindrance to making sure that you're expanding your connection. So, you know, those are things that we're looking to, to double down on at Walker's Legacy, what we're focusing on, and how we're supporting the women who are sharing their concerns with us. Thank you. That was, that was great. Uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, Eurasia, I would like to bring in this conversation if you can. You know, obviously the pandemic was, you know, global. Um, it's, you know, it is ongoing. Um, you know, and at Shopify, obviously, I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of this firsthand. Um, you know, um, some of entrepreneurs using online, um, you know, tools maybe for the first time. You know, I'd love to hear from you and, and Shopify why you chose to support the coalition. Yeah, absolutely. I think for Shopify, there was a, an initial commitment to supporting just black businesses across the board. Um, and part of that for us was focusing externally, like there are definitely resources internally that we have, but there's so many amazing organizations and companies that are doing that um, sort of work already. And we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. So partnering with um, organizations like the Coalition to Back Black Businesses was open an easy an easy thing to think about so we wanted to be able to partner with organizations like that that were committed to to this long term not just for the trendy moment um not just for a quick second but to make a long-term commitment to really helping black businesses grow and i think for shopify like you said during the pandemic there were a lot of businesses that had to um, pivot and go online um, that had to learn digital skills whether they were like veteran brick and mortar businesses or they were new folks who have maybe left a job previously and were now dipping their foot into the entrepreneurial pool. Um, either way, we wanted to create resources and have resources that support everyone at different business stages. Um, and so Shopify made a commitment to creating a team specifically dedicated to supporting Black businesses. And that's that's the team that I'm a part of and I love the work that we do. That's great. That's really interesting. And I think, um, you know, I'd love to hear from you about, um, you know, the Shopify business. People may have heard the brand. People may generally understand, you know, what you're doing. But can you get, paint, paint a little more of a picture about who Shopify is and, you know, why you uh, may be integral to some of the stuff they, they may know they're doing, but they may not know sort of what that means. Yeah, absolutely. I think when people hear Shopify, they actually most often they confuse it with Spotify. We're not Spotify. <laughs> um, we're Shopify and we're also an e-commerce platform. But more than just the platform, there's an entire arsenal of resources that are um, created to support businesses, whether they're online or not. Um, so if they are brick and mortar businesses, there are um, POS systems and retail focused um, resources and hardware that help businesses in that arena. And if not, then there are a ton of digital resources that are created. Um, but it's essentially this toolkit for all type of businesses and to help those businesses grow. So that's essentially what Shopify is. And there's obviously tons of teams and departments um, in the background working to make sure that this toolkit um, of things like access to capital and funding and um, redu reduction of barriers, that all of those things are working seamlessly to, to help businesses scale and to help businesses grow, because that's ultimately the goal. We mm -hmm. want to see as many entrepreneurs as possible. 
That's great. And, um, you know, I think we'll come back to you definitely because I want to definitely hear more about maybe some of the um, tools and things you have to, or some of the business leaders that we have uh, available. And I also want to bring Melody, you know, back into this conversation. As well. <laughs> In that, um, you know, I know uh, Melody's been our partner um, at, with Eureka, um, really helping with some of our coalition um, entrepreneurs. And I'd love to hear, you know, how that's going and, you know, some of the you know, information that, uh, you know, you can provide to us, you know, from your support of the coalition. Thanks so much, Brody. Well, I'm a visionary. Eureka is to help a million small business entrepreneurs get access to the digital world. Well, we know that, I heard you guys talk that, about it um, during COVID. We found that a lot of businesses need to pivot. They needed to do that in order to make money to keep their doors open. And so that's where Eureka has been very, um, we've been very steadfast in helping entrepreneurs switch you move from those brick and mortar spaces into the digital medium. And that's the thing about Eureka, what we do here to help businesses is to get them to that place. We help them, <clears throat> excuse me, we help them understand their um, their growth and we help them understand how they get customers and how they keep and expand the customers that they have digitally. And, you know, we have some proven methods that we use to help entrepreneurs where we tell them what it is that's wrong. We'll tell them um, how to fix it. And so they understand what it is they need to be in the right space for digital. So, so Melody, you have, is it like, is it a curriculum that you have that yeah, you the great thing about Eureka is a plat- Yeah, the great thing about Eureka is a platform where we have technology, we have courses, and we have services. So we have a growth center where you can come in as a member, put in your URL, and and it'll give you information about um, it'll give you information about how your uh, market effectiveness is going, your website mechanics, and those are the things that uh, help you rank higher when it comes to different search engines and to make sure that more customers get to your site. And so that's one of the things that um, is really, I guess, exciting about Eureka uh, entrepreneurs being able to come in every day and look at the work that they're doing, the money they're putting behind their websites to make sure that they're. Really Getting a return on it. So uh, the courses are worksheet based courses with live coaches who can help them. We have coaching almost every day except for Sunday. And we have a community platform where entrepreneurs can work together. They can meet other entrepreneurs who are, you know, learning different things in Eureka and they are able to, you know, kind of work together. We know that a lot of times entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs and they don't have people they can run different ideas by. And that's why the community at Eureka and our coaches and mentors come in handy to help entrepreneurs through this growth space. Well, that's, that is really great. All right, so I, I really want to dig in and into the tools, right? Something very specific we can give folks listening today. Um, so you see if I come to you, I mean, you know, Shopify, a large company, do you have specific tools or, you know, ideas that you can give to our, to folks listening here about really how they can help them grow their business? Absolutely. Um, I think one of the first things that Shopify did specifically for Black businesses was create a 120-day trial. Um, And this was created with the knowledge that it takes maybe a little more time as people are making that transition into being on the digital um, surface uh, to understand how the platform works and to really dig into what it takes to market a company, to create a website, to put all of those things together before you go live. Um, And so that trial is supposed to help you walk through the process But while we're doing that, like um, Melody mentioned, there's the importance of community. So we have a Build Black community that has over 1,300 merchants in it who are just supporting and talking to each other, engaging with each other and encouraging each other. Um, And it's just a great way to be able to be with like-minded individuals who are going through the same things that you're going through, but ultimately providing solutions to any struggles or obstacles that you're facing. Um, And in that community, there are monthly workshops as well that um, come up based on what people's needs are. And so if people currently are struggling with social media marketing, for example, um, it's kind of dynamic in the way that we then see that and see that need and we're able to create content um, and run workshops that talk about social media marketing and the ways to support Um, entrepreneurs in that. Um, 
the ultimate that ultimately falls under the one mbb program the one million black businesses program and it's shopify's commitment at least for the next 10 years to supporting and elevating um, a million black businesses by providing them with these tools as well as giving them access to all of the tools that already exist at the company um, in terms of education and resourcing to really elevate these black businesses and, and I think, uh, is it true like that I think you provided a link maybe to our team that yeah. for that? Is that okay? Well, I think that that might be uh, being presented right now. And so you know, I think that's a Shopify link that it, it, it sort of lays that out in, in, um, in detail. Yes. So it talks a bit about the program um, and all of the things behind it, but also allows you to be able to apply for that community, like I mentioned, as well as have access to that 120 day trial. Um, and that's free. So definitely a good thing to sort of use and get your feet wet on the Shopify platform. And there's a lot of support as well in the background for people who have tons of questions. Um, we're aware of that and aware that people may not necessarily know what to do or where to go. And so we have a lot of people around to support you. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much, Eris. Um, you know, again, you work with a lot of you know entrepreneurs. You, you talked about you kind of laid the groundwork out there. How how are you? What are things today that you can you know tell people to do or? Yeah, I mean, I think we've all spoken to similar approaches, and and I'm you know I often tell business owners and um, founders who are trying to identify resources and identify programs uh, to support their capacity is really the importance of finding an organization, an entity, an opportunity that fits you where you are at this point in your um, entrepreneurial journey and just who you are in terms of your spirit. And so when I think about Walker's legacy, you know, we too work um, in a collaborative way. We make sure that we're providing coaching and mentoring and guidance um, and creating that sense of tribe and community. Uh, but, you know, I tell people that we're an organization that is really suited for that woman who is, you know, more than likely a solo entrepreneur, you know, who is probably uh, you know, pre-revenue or just, you know, uh, at a state where they're generating revenue below $100,000. So real scrappy, real gritty, um, and who wants to go through uh, an experience with other like-minded women, you know, led by other like-minded women. And so at Walker's Legacy, we have our Women Who Enterprise Business Accelerator Program. Uh, those applications will actually open uh, on the 21st of February. We have our Prospectus Business Accelerator Program, which is our second tier. We'll open that up in the fall. And what's great about that is that you literally go through and every piece of your business is assessed, right? We're not just focusing on the social media. We're not just focusing on the finance or the operations, but all of it. We want to make sure that when women complete this program, uh, they have a really solid business plan. Um, we create resource guides. We're one of the partners with Eureka. Uh, so, you know, we are bringing, I think, a holistic wraparound approach uh, to cultivating this next generation uh, of what we call legacy makers. So I encourage everyone to follow us on social media, uh, check us out, um, and make sure that if you're a woman uh, and you're in one of the major markets, we have so many markets, we're serving DC, Birmingham, um, Rochester, New York, Atlanta, Chicago, Indy, Cleveland, uh, all the great cities that you apply to participate um, in our Women Who Enterprise Accelerator. That's fantastic. That's yes. fantastic. Thank you so much. And well, Melody, I, I'll ask you as well, you know, Eureka, you've been at an intersection of both the coalition and obviously working with uh, Walker's Legacy as well. What are there other, other other resources that are out there that, that you guys, you mentioned a couple earlier, but are there other ones? Absolutely. And I want to tell you about the courses. The courses are um, tangible. Every From the day one, from the first day you walk into a class or I guess turn on your computer, there's something actionable for you to do about your business. Nothing is in theory. So all the work that you do to make sure that you have the right strategy, you have the right customer mindset, you're doing it for your business. So we're really, um, are, our entrepreneurs get really excited and they get a lot of information from the coaches and along with the uh, technology that we have with the growth center those are the things that are going to help our clients uh, our clients who are entrepreneurs those are the things that want to help them grow their businesses they also have the ability to um 
we have services where you can, we can do web buying traffic or so to make sure that you have the right customers coming to your uh, business. We make sure to find out who your customers are, who is your audience. And we have all those services and technologies to help entrepreneurs with their website and to grow digitally. That's fantastic. And I, and I think, did you, did you also provide a, a link to uh, some resources at Eureka? Yeah, yeah, I did. We are offering a 60 day free pro membership trial. And so we want you to come on and take advantage of all the courses, the services and the technology and the tools that we have as resources for entrepreneurs. We really know that you will um, find your place there and you can ask whatever questions you need and find a community to help you get through those barriers. And that's what Eureka is here for. Mainly we focus on, this, on underserved communities, whether it's economically challenged, black, brown, LGBTQIA, those are the companies that we're focused on. We want to help you with uh, digital direct and mainstream to digital. That's great. Well, look, I, I really want to thank our panel, you know, really dynamic panel and, you know, really given some very concrete examples of things, you know, our business owners can do right now, which is you know, what you would, I think is, again, hopefully we're coming out of pandemic um, and really thinking about business growth. And so, we have the coalition of backlog businesses, you know, are supporting that as well. And so you know, I really want to thank all of you today. I really want to thank everyone for attending today. Um, and again, we are at webackbusinesses.com is where the hub for all of our information is. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you again. Thank you. The biggest challenge was finding a manufacturer and getting them made. That was that was a, a six month kind of ordeal from losing our first manufacturer to finding the one that we landed with. Um, that was very difficult. Um, but the second one is probably um, just capital. It's really hard to bootstrap a business, especially in a pandemic. I'm an actor in New York. Acting in New York was shut down for a year, so it was a it was a very challenging um, time financially in terms of like, am I going to continue to um, put money towards this vision I have, or am I going to pay my rent uh, because I've been out of work for a year? Um, luckily, um, later last year I was awarded a, another grant that was that was very helpful in kind of keeping the ball rolling. But access to capital, I think in general for most businesses, but also particularly for minority owned businesses is, is very is very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, we've made it kind of through that and we're kind of onto the next phase of, of our capital journey, but it, it's hard. It's very hard, especially when you can't advertise and you don't have marketing to kind of fall back on to help you. Um, all of our growth so far has been organic. It's been word of mouth. Um, a couple people share things on social media and that's worked really well for us but that's not something we can necessarily depend on as we continue to grow so greetings i'm brian butler president and ceo of vistra communications and i'm excited extremely excited to be engaged with the u.s chamber please allow me to say thank you to our speakers who shared those important insights and perspectives. What an inspiring and informative dialogue. I also want to thank each of you in our audience for being a part of this very important conversation about how we can build and better support the Black business ecosystem. It goes without saying that Black and minority owned businesses are pillars in their communities, creating jobs and fueling economic opportunities. And just like all business owners, the entrepreneurs we heard from today want to build, grow, and have greater impact. That's why forums like this one are so important, reminding us to help these businesses thrive despite the many challenges they may face. As a business owner and a member of the US Chamber of Commerce's Board of Directors, I am proud to be a part of this dialogue and the broader commitment we've made to develop and advance solutions 
that help close race-based opportunity gaps, especially for our small and growing diverse businesses. I'm even more honored to be a part of today's conversation, but even more excited to stay engaged beyond this event today. Through initiatives like the Coalition of Black Businesses and the Chamber's Equality of Opportunity Initiative, we will continue to expand support for and invest in Black-owned businesses and entrepreneurs. Whether inspiring the next generation of innovators or helping to open doors to greater access to capital, corporate supply chains, business networks, and other business opportunities. We will work in partnership to advance solutions that promote growth, opportunity, and success for all businesses. Thank you again for joining us today. Please visit uschamber.com to find out more about the Equality of Opportunity Initiative and how you can partner with or engage the U.S. Chamber as we work to build an inclusive economy and realize true progress for the business community and our nation. Thank you.